So we're going to hear from Tim now about the critical evaluation of smartphone apps as tools for water quality monitoring in inland waters. Welcome. Thank you. So this work uh, very neatly follows on the previous two talks and exactly the same theme. And really it's about, uh, I guess it's some of the contributing work that actually led up to the award of this uh, project to Janet on uh, developing this out further. So this was largely the work of, uh, I'm presenting here, of Renee Omson, who did an undergraduate dissertation with me. She was based at the University of uh, Queensland. Uh, and this was in evaluating the Eye on Water app, uh, plus also another app which I'll, I'll talk about, which is a very similar app um, developed, in, developed in North America. Um, and as part of this talk, I also want to talk a little bit uh, towards the end about a, uh, a water quality sensor. We've also developed a low-cost one. So this work is all set in the context of this, of this uh, project, which was awarded under this, uh, under this um, Department of Innovation and, Sci and Science um, grant to, to uh, Janet's project. It sort of feeds into that. So uh, Hans pre presented information, uh, a cycle and a triangle. Janet did in a circle. I can only think in straight lines, I'm afraid. Um, but what we have is a similar vision. It's really this whole idea of scalable complementary information services. So we might have water quality testing uh, using chemical kits at the, at the stream level. But then we also have citizen science coming in. Uh, and this is Renee actually taking measurements during the project work here using smartphone apps. So uh, a sort of wider, wider uptake. Not everybody has a chemical analysis kit. We have some near surface sensors and then we also we have at the end of it satellite data and some sort of product that we can visualise and give out more information at the end. And as Janet mentioned, the key challenge for doing that stuff with satellites, which is really one of our key interests because then we can get sort of continental coverage for Australia, which is one of our goals, is really having sufficient validation data and calibration data on which to, on which to do it. So the citizen science addresses that. And also, to meet a sort of middle point, we've, we've also developed this uh, near-surface sensor, which I'll talk about. So all of those, those tools, if we use a smartphone camera, we use a near-surface sensor and we use a satellite, they're all based on optical measurements. They're simply measuring the colour of the water in some way and relating that to, to uh, water quality. So this whole underlying basis is that, is that really it's driven by, driven by colour and that there's information in that colour that relates to water quality. So if we measure the graph, the big graph in the middle, if we measure the reflectance using, uh, at high spectral resolution using a tool called a spectroradiometer, we get different curves for different colours of water bodies. We see up the left there we get very different curves. And those curves, the shape of those curves, is very much punctuated by the contents of the water. So if there's an algal bloom with very high chlorophyll uh, and also with um, cyanobacteria in it, we see punctuations particularly, and I should point out, this is the sort of largely the visible spectrum that we're looking at this, uh, this, this uh, data at. Uh, but we see the, the, the shapes of those reflectances very much punctuated by the pigments present in those in those algal species. So chlorophyll stands out and phycocyanins and, and cyanobacteria show out as well. But we also see the influence of, of dissolved organic colour in the water and suspended solids in other areas. We can then combine this information to form very useful indices, and that's the, that's the graph on the top right, just for a relationship between, essentially a mathematical relationship between three of those wave bands and chlorophyll A. And, we get a, and for a number of different water bodies around Australia, and we get a very good relationship so we, have, we can quantitatively, we can measure the reflectance and quantitatively derive some water quality parameters from it. The only problem, of course, as Hans pointed out, that a camera, just like the human eye, can only really measure in RGB, red, green and blue. That's all, all, that's all that, that's essentially sensitive. So there's a question then. So the, the resolution is very spectrally limited. Then uh, how, how good are these apps for actually relating to, to uh, water quality? And I guess while, uh, while um, much of the previous two talks are perhaps on the, citizens, the citizen part of this, my concentration has been on, well, what is it we're going to get out of this project to actually deliver better science? So there's a few science questions that come out of that. They are, you know, are these smartphone apps valid tools to measure water, water colour? How reliable are they? That's a, that's a key question. When, when conditions overhead change, things like that, cloudy environments, etc., etc., clear sky. How does the appropriately named FU scale 
matched to Australia's inland waters. Um, that relates, I guess, to the, to the previous question. How can we use it to inform on water quality? And then, importantly for us, how can we then actually use that information to improve the accuracy of our satellite uh, products? So the first one needs no introduction. The first app we tested uh, was this Ion Water app, which Hans uh, very adequately, ex adequately explained. You take a, a kind of horizontal picture of the water, you scroll, you scroll up and uh, choose the appropriate, um, appropriate water colour uh, floral yield scale seen on the bottom there to match the, uh, the colour of the water, and that gets uploaded to the database as Hans explains. explains. So I'm going to skip over that. This second app we, we tested was this other one called Hydrocolour. Uh, developed in the University of Maine. So this, um, this is a very similar kind of app, but it takes uh, perhaps a slightly more rigorous approach to, or, or a more complex approach, let's say, to the measurement of, of colour, and it requires you to take three separate measurements. You need to take a measurement of a Kodak grey card, so the photographer's grey card, which costs about sort of five or eight bucks. Uh, and that essentially, essentially measures just the ambient, the ambient uh, illumination conditions at the time of your measurement. You also need to take a measurement of the sky and of the water surface. And the app uses all of the accelerometers and inclinometers in, in the phone to actually guide you through making those measurements at very strict uh, geometric angles. Now, there's a set, set, uh, I, won't wait for, I won't go into it, there's a set number of angles you need to make these uh, measurements over. And so essentially that capture button only goes green when you actually match up the tilt of the phone and the angle of the phone to get the right angle of measurement over each of those grey sky and, and water surface conditions. At the end then the app calculates a reflectance in those, in those uh, red, green and blue channels and it then uses an internal algorithm to calculate what was the turbidity of the water and what is the suspended particulate matter, SPM, concentration. Thing. So, and what we did was then to uh, test those apps, make, making measurements of those apps, and tested them against spectral measurements made with a spectral radiometer, um, a, a sort of $30,000 device to, to measure the, the spectrum, which does, does uh, very well. So, to, uh, to sort of summarise, this is a rather a messy slide, but essentially, in order to perform that comparison, what we did was, it, was took that um, spectroradiometer data and actually resampled it back simply into the RGB. So we took this, the spectral sensitivities of the cameras, and, and I should point out these were based on two iPhone, the study was based on two iPhone 6s, and, uh, and we resampled the, the spectroradiometer data back to RGB and simply compared it. So this is the, um, this is the comparison for hydrocolour, and we see the, the Atlantic RGB in uh, red there and the hydrocolour reflectance in, in blue. And that we perform these measurements over a number of water bodies around the Brisbane area, thanks to uh, SEQ Water, but also a, number, a few water bodies in the Hunter Valley in, in New South Wales. And here we, we have a number of those comparisons in, in, made in different water bodies. We were also replicating these, these measurements. And you can see that these water bodies were very different in their water qualities. Uh, ranging from lakes and clear there, which was a very clear, very clear, very uh, uh, low productivity lake, up to um, up to some of the higher ones like Lake Dyer in the top right was a very was had a full-on algal bloom at the time of measurement. Um, but essentially, you can see these me these measurements are made slightly different uh, geometrically in the in the field. You can see that basically the phone app is, is following the phone app and the Atlantic data, although they don't agree on the same scale because they're a, diff they're a different kind of measurement. They agree roughly in shape uh, of the measurement uh, being made. So there's some confidence that these apps are producing reasonable data. If we then make a comparison on the bottom left-hand side with uh, measured turbidity, so we're also measuring water quality variables like turbidity, chlorophyll A, secchi disk, as Janet mentioned. Uh, we actually see that the comparison between hydrocolour and measured turbidity is actually a really good one. We also made some other measurements, so we were replicating the measurements, and, and we also determined those days which were actually cloudy when we were out in the field, which were unfortunately cloudy, versus those under clear conditions. And we see that under cloudy conditions, perhaps naturally, the results are far more variable than they are under, under clear conditions. So that's a, a thing that needs to be, uh, to be highlighted. In a straight 
RGB comparison of, then of ion water and hydrocolour, it's much more difficult, of course, to, to measure, to relate the floral yield scale to water quality variables. That's a uh, project yet to come, I guess. But here we see a comparison with ion water in the blue and hydrocolour in the red, and we see very good agreement. And this is, this is where um, there will be variation, of course, because the apps are actually measuring in a very different geometry. Hydrocolour measures with the foam flat, looking straight down at the water, it gets a lot more uh, surface water reflectance off it than does the uh, hydrocolour app. But there's lots of confidence that actually both of those apps are producing reasonable estimates of, uh, of water, quali- water colour. So we can conclude then that we're getting, a, uh, for both of those apps, a fairly reasonable approximation of RGB reflectance uh, um, and, a, and a good estimate of, of water colour. And this is important for our, our satellite measurements. Um, the, we're fairly confident, and I think with a little bit more testing, and, and there's a recent paper come out on, on, that has come out on um, hydrocolour, which I haven't read yet, which I think should, gives a lot more confidence around its estimates of uh, particulate matter and turbidity. Um, but we would recommend for actually doing replicated measurements, that, that a one-off is probably not, not uh, sufficient in this case. The, the important thing, I think, is, is really for what we want to do, if I can just skip back a few, few, slides, few slides, perhaps to this floral yield scale at the top, what we really want to do is be able to say, well, can we use the floral yield in particular to, to indicate optical water types? If we know optical water types of, say, green, uh, green-dominated lakes, brown-dominated, blue-dominated lakes, that helps us very much tailor our algorithms for our satellite retrievals and will considerably help us improve the accuracy of those, that satellite data. So just in summary, just uh, towards the end, two, two more slides on, on uh, this near surface sensor that I'd just like to uh, talk about as well, since, it, since it's a very important intermediate step. So as part of, part of this process, we have uh, said, well, can we, can we actually package up a spectroradiometer develop an, a sensor which, which works in the optical, optical domain but actually does this much more simply or m- m- much, uh, much more cheaper, let's say, than a um, $30,000 spectroradiometer. And so a very clever person by the name of Stephen Gensimer at, at CSIRO came up with a, uh, an optical throughput system, a spectrometer, in it, uh, that essentially uh, measured all, all those inputs. You need, you need three separate measurements to make an ac- accurate measure of water colour, just like the hydrocolour app does. Uh, and, he's, and he's basically combined all of that very cleverly into one, one spectrometer. Um, this just shows the, uh, um, it has multiple inputs, so we could, we could actually add up to lots and lots of different uh, optical inputs into the system. And it just shows two trials of the sensor, one here on the Brisbane River, the, the very brown one on the top right. We have a permanently installed sensor on the Melbourne water treatment ponds at, uh, at Werribee. The image on the bottom right shows the latest version of this, and we're just producing about uh, 10 more of these instruments to put them out into New South Wales as part of a, a project on algal bloom alerting uh, around New South Wales. But it measures high spectral re- resolution, uh, reflectance, and what we see is essentially a whole uh, uh, something that sort of citizen science doesn't address is that essentially these are permanently mounted, we envisage these as permanently mounted sensors on water bodies, continuously monitoring day in, day out, sending information. It's just a mechanised version of a, of a um, citizen scientist. These measure high spectral resolution. So this is a comparison then of measurements made with the sensor versus uh, measurements made with the spectroideometer. And you can see, except for some differences into the, in the blue region, which are actually less important for algal blooms, we see actually very good correspondence between our sensor in the black and the uh, spectroradiometer, the much more expensive spectroradiometer in the dashed line. So as, as I said, we see these as, as simply that complement in, uh, sorry, wrong way, essentially that those near surface sensors form a very useful complement and a link from the citizen science with right through to, that's me, there's my time up, right through to calibration of satellite data at the end. Ultimately, the science is leading us, the science is driving us towards better information for validating satellite data. Thanks, I'll leave it at that. Thanks.